intolerable. Um, I think there's a bit of Victorian hyperbole in that, but nonetheless, it was clearly not an easy place, um, not an easy place to work. Uh, and the sand was a problem. However, um, it was a successful undertaking. Um, this is uh, the peninsula in 1947. Uh, and I'm showing you this partly because it's of interest as in being in 1947. But it gives you an idea of what was going on in the foreground here. This is the sort of main, if you like, the main industrial manufacturing bit which is at the core of, of the Ardia site. <clears throat> but round about it, this is looking down the peninsula to Irvin at the bottom and the Garnet on the left there, you can see that um, although this is all being used in one form or another, it's actually being lightly used. It's all vegetated or virtually all vegetated. Um, little buildings surrounded by uh, blast walls made of sand heaped up and so on. And the point about that is that um, although the area was heavily used, it wasn't used in the way that normally you would think of industry with concrete and tarmac and so on. It was there in, in this core bit and we'll come back to that later. But most of the site was still under grass. You can see here the old railway line that went down to the the jetty where they shift, shipped out the, the uh, explosives. There's a couple of, or one quick one to show you some of the scale of the operations. Um, the sand hills, either natural or man-made, were important. One of the things that made Nobel successful was he'd, he had a, a way of changing nitroglycerin, which is very explosive and very unstable, into dynamite. And there was a, a gravity feed system. Um, the details are beyond me and certainly beyond tonight. Um, so he was making use of the sand hills uh, as, a, as a positive thing for, for the works. You can see from the size of the explosives train, the scale of operation. And later on, as we'll mention briefly, um, Nobel became part of ICI, part one of the founding firms that set up ICI, and the whole thing expanded into beyond explosives, into research, into uh, a whole host of other things. And these are labs and research facilities and so on. So just as a brief rundown, <clears throat> established 1871, as I say, it produced dynamite. Um, it was obviously strategically important in the world wars. Um, the National Library of Scotland has some Luftwaffe uh, photographs of our deer that were taken um, in advance of not very many bombing raids, as it happens. It's surprising it wasn't bombed a bit more. It became the largest explosive factory in the world and covered about 500 hectares. So it was a huge area and with a very large workforce. Uh, 13,000 people. And it was the mainstay of um, the local area in terms of employment. So it closed down in various bits and various stages from 1970s onwards and so on. And most of it is now owned by NPL estates and we'll come back to them later as well. So <clears throat> a quick look at our deer now and this is the sort of core industrial area uh, that I mentioned, which is fenced off, um, still contains an explosive factory, the Kemring, uh, Kemring Works. Um, none of what I'm talking about tonight concerns what goes on in here because it's fenced off and we don't have any access. That's the industrial estate up at the top. The main bits we're going to be talking about are the peninsula, which we looked at in the first slide. Um, Garnet West, on the west side of the river Garnet there, um, which contains the black powder wood, which tells you what happened in there. And on the other side of the Garnet is Garnet East. And it's worth just mentioning as well that um, round about here, you've got 
railway lines and so on. So the whole area is still, to a large extent, fairly isolated. And again, as we'll see, that's important. So what we have is the second largest brownfield site in Scotland, as officially designated. <clears throat> but because of what I mentioned at the beginning about the, the maintenance of the, the grass, of the vegetation in, in most of the site, we have um, a patchwork of habitats. Partly that's uh, dune habitats, but also new ones that were created, both woodland and wetland. Um, and these have been created over the years, have had various lengths of time to develop and mature. And we have currently a mosaic of habitats that go from the coast through sand dunes to open water and woodland. A range of habitats is probably unrivaled anywhere, and certainly unrivaled anywhere in Ayrshire, but you'd be hard put to find anywhere comparable anywhere in Scotland. What I'm going to do is to run through these habitats very quickly, starting at the coast and working <coughs> inland. And I'm not going to spend long on each bit because um, we don't have time, but uh, I think it's worth just uh, giving a quick view of what some of the, the habitats look like, and mostly invertebrates, um, I'll mention birds and plants to a limited extent, but uh, not much more. This is on the, the sea side. You have a large, a very large sea wall, which runs all the way from Stevenson pretty well down to the tip of the peninsula. So you're looking at the best part of, I think, three kilometres. Um, at the bottom end, the sea wall is starting to break down. And we'll come back to the sea wall again uh, later on. I put in this big ground beetle, partly because it's a typical one of the sea coast, but there's actually not a very good uh, coastline in terms of biodiversity because there's no dunes in this bit. There's no four dunes or embryo dunes. Uh, so the, the, the range of plants, for example, and consequently the range of animals is a bit limited. We skip over to the other side of the peninsula You've got the salt marsh and the mud flats, which make up the bogside flats SSSI. <coughs> it's the biggest estuary in the lower Clyde, the biggest area of salt marsh in the lower Clyde. So it's important for that, and that's one of the reasons why it's an SSSI. But as many of the people who are watching tonight will know, it's a prime site in Ayrshire for birds. Waders, wildfowl in particular, um, odd rarities and so on turn up. Um, we haven't done as much surveying there as perhaps it deserves in terms of the invertebrates, but this little chap here is a leaf beetle, um, which is typical of salt marsh. Its larvae feed on various uh, salt marsh plants like sea arrow grass. I'll use terms like scarce and rare and so on, and these are kind of interchangeable terms. Um, it depends whether you're meaning nationally scarce, locally scarce, or whatever, but I'll try and clarify that. This beast here is, is nationally scarce. That's in the UK nationally, not just Scottish nationally. So in between these two <coughs> sides to the peninsula, you've got the sand dunes. And you can see there, there's still some fairly big dunes. Um, these are mostly up to the top end. Um, down towards the tip of the peninsula, it tends to be a bit flatter, not quite as high, but they're still some are, uh, a good size. Um, there's a range of, of plants, flowering plants, which support butterflies, etc., and, and various other invertebrates. And also worthy of note is the bare sand. This is when rabbit scrapes and wind blown areas like this, where the bird's foot trefoil is. And these areas of bare sand are very important for invertebrates because they tend to be sheltered, they heat up quickly, and that uh, favours invertebrates that, that obviously like the heat, um, can burrow in the sand and so on, and, and that makes up a considerable part of the, the, um, the biological interest on the peninsula. 
couple of plants that you get there that are um, certainly scarce in, in Ayrshire, uh, Moonwort, and, uh, which is a wee fern, and Ruley saxifrage. There's only one spot on the peninsula, as far as I know, where you get it, but it's uh, quite a big patch. So, <clears throat> to get down to the invertebrates properly, I've put this up. I'm not going to do the same level of detail for all the habitats because that take forever. But I put this up to try and illustrate what I meant by local and national rarity. If we start up in the top left here with the hairy horned sand beetle, uh, a splendid name for a very small beast, it's about three or four millimetres long. <clears throat> this is taken from the NBN Atlas. It's not actually quite up to date, but it still shows you that this is a scarce beast, obviously coastal, nationally, UK nationally rare. Um, so that's, if you like, at the extreme end of rarity. Um, other, th other types of things that you get here, if you take the northern Calites, which is a, um, a burrowing mi mining bee, when you look at its distribution, you see that it is a predominantly north and west beast. And at our deer, it's near its southern limits. So it's nationally scarce. Um, and even in Scotland, it's pretty scarce. So it's a northern one, if you like, at its southern limits at our deer. The spider is the other way around. It's relatively common in the south but very scarce in Scotland. And our deer, as far as I'm aware, is about its northern limits. Not quite the same with the, the shore wainscot north, but again, it's much commoner south in the south than it is up here. And these two beasts are both uh, nationally scarce. The hoverfly and the, the beetle, and they have an, an amazingly similar distribution. In Wales, um, just the odd one in the northwest of England, um, and our deer. And there are other species which are found in the area which have that same distribution. So keep in your mind, things can be nationally or locally, sorry, nationally rare or scarce. They can be locally rare or scarce. They can be at the northern limits or southern limits. And there's a whole range of in insects that fall into, and invertebrates that fall into these categories. And that's what makes the place so important. Um, within the sand dunes, you've got sub-habitats, if you like, dune heath, um, dominated by heather, obviously, but with patches of bare sand and, and lichens and so on. Uh, some typical species like the heath uh, bumblebee and the heath rustic moth. Um, the epiolus is, a, is a, um, a cuckoo bee on the sorts of th things that we saw in the, in the previous, and the calites that we saw in the previous slide. And the minotaur, uh, which is one of my favourite ones, um, this is at its northern limits, as is the apiolus. Um, minotaur is a splendid large beetle which um, burrows into the sand and makes tunnels into the sand down to a meter, meter and a half deep. So this sort of sandy habitat is absolutely crucial for it. And also in amongst the dunes, <coughs> you've got dune slacks. These are areas where the sand, the ground is, uh, sorry, the ground is just about at the water table. So in the winter, probably just now with the weather we've been having, um, these will be wet and possibly in this, this case of this, this one here, flooded and will remain wet or flooded through the winter and will dry out in the summer to become damp or maybe uh, slightly drier than damp. But that seasonal fluctuation creates conditions that um, support a particular suite of species. This beetle, for example, uh, the only other place in Scotland you get it is at the RSPB Reserve at Merse Head. Um, these two uh, wasps here are spider hunters. This one hunts spiders and this one hunts the spiders 
that this one has already caught. So this yeah. is you know, the kleptoparasite. And the blithyza there is another nationally scarce beast. Moving on into the uh, woodland, <clears throat> which is largely but not entirely in Garnet West. Um, much of it is uh, Corsican pine plantation, but there's lots of regeneration and there has been planting of broadleaves as well. So it, it's quite varied in places, but the majority of it is the Corsican pine and it's fairly over mature. Um, it's not been particularly managed. There's lots of dead wood. You can see some perhaps just down in the bottom there. So um, interesting uh, contrast to the peninsula. Uh, a good suite of birds there. I'm sure they're better oh, known to uh, many of the people watching than they are to me. Um, and there's a heronry, for example. Um, it's actually in, uh, in conifers on the peninsula, the heronry is. But a range of other things which have or do breed there, like long-eared owl, raven, uh, uh, garden warbler, and so on. So a good range of uh, bird species. So it's not just invertebrates. But uh, <coughs> similar to the um, the sand dunes, we have a range of um, scarce beasts. The Magdalis beetle here, the weevil is a native pinewood species. Presumably it's got to our deer in, in trees that were transplanted from the north of Scotland. And probably the same goes for the for the Triarina here, which in Scotland is a, a native pinewood hoverfly. It's a bee mimic. Um, the larvae live in, in, in rotting wood. Um, the fan-bearing wood borer, I don't really like common names because they just become ridiculous, but never mind. Fan-bearing wood, bearing wood borer, this is a male with these spectacular antennae, again about three millimetres long, so you've got to look closely to, to see the details, but pretty scarce in Scotland, although fairly widespread down south. Um, and this, and the Magdalis, um, make holes in trees and lay their eggs in, in trees. And uh, the wee um, chrysocerus here, which is um, uh, on a finger? hunting wasp, it hunts um, small flies. It uses the holes made, the emergence holes made by um, things like this uh, for its nest. So <clears throat> the things that are interrelated and interact. And again, you can see, as I say, the, the, the variation in distribution, picking out obviously scarce species, um, but uh, there are plenty that fit into these categories. Uh, moving on to the wetland, this is largely, but again, not entirely in Garnet East. There's also plenty of wetland, a fair bit of wetland in Garnet West, but the majority of it is here, there's over 100 hectares of wetland, so it's a, a substantial area. Um, I'd tell you whether it is, but I would imagine it must be one of the largest wetlands in Ayrshire. Um, and it's a mixture of open water. These, I, I'm assuming, were originally fire ponds. Um, a large area of swamp up here, um, but scrub and woodland as well. So this is um, overlooking, I think it's probably overlooking this area here. So you've got uh, reed mace in the foreground looking over to, to uh, swamp and scrub in the background. And again, it's a range of, of beasts, lesser white throat. Again, lots of you chaps will know more about it than me, but um, Tom Byers has done a, had a long term a survey um, and monitoring of, of the lesser white throat breeding um, population in, in, in at our deer. Uh, migrant hawker that's uh, moving northwards in Britain, and again, this is just about its northern limit, as with this wee water beetle here. 
the water rail is interesting uh, because in a previous survey, which is a few years ago now, it was claimed that our deer held 6% of the breeding population of water rail in the UK. I don't know if that's still the case or not, but at that level, that makes it nationally important for, for water rail, um, an ideal sort of habitat for it. And finally, in terms of habitats, even in the bits that uh, I'm talking about today, there are um, plenty of redundant bits of building. This here is, uh, I presume, a storage building covered over with sand and vegetated. And between that bit, there's a sort of passageway, this passageway here, uh, between the building and this blast wall. So that's the blast wall and that's a building there. So um, there's a, a number of these uh, in, in neat rows in Gardner East. Um, they've not been looked at really at all, but I suspect that um, they might well be interesting for bats and are worth, a, worth another look. So what have we found? <coughs> Um, we found somewhere in excess of 1,500 species, um, either in recent surveys or uh, in, in surveys that have been done over the past few years. I should stress that this isn't a definitive list, this is um, a provisional list. I don't think that there'll be very many more birds added, for example, probably not many more plants. But will be certainly a lot more bees, wasps, flies, bugs, uh, probably fungi and lichens and spiders as well, and even beetles, although there's a lot of beetles there. There are many more to be found. Um, so this looks quite impressive, and it is, but um, it's by no means the final list if there, could, if there can ever be such a thing as a final list. So why is our deer so good for invertebrates? Um, well, for one thing, it's a large site, and it's a big site with great habitat diversity. And while plants, particularly perhaps, um, and to some extent birds, will reflect that habitat diversity, invertebrates, because they're much smaller, do that better. Um, one tree can hold many, many, many species. So you're always going to get more invertebrates um, than you will of, of, of other groups. Um, and that habitat diversity and the large size combined mean that um, there's going to be a lot of, of invertebrate species. But also, <coughs> it's worth bearing in mind that uh, the Ayrshire climate is relatively mild, certainly in the coast. And although it might not seem like it sometimes, it is relatively sheltered. You've got Aran and Kintyre uh, that maybe ameliorate the conditions slightly. And one can guess that it's partly for this reason that some of the southern species can survive further north than anywhere else in, in, in the UK. Things like the Minotaur, um, some of the the, um, the wasps and so on as well, bees and wasps. It's also worth noting, and I, th I think this is right, I've had a quick look to try and check, but our deer is getting on for the most northerly area of extensive sand dunes on the west coast of the mainland. There's plenty of sand dunes uh, further north and in the islands, but not really on the mainland. And it's a big jump to go from our deer and Stevenson to get to other big areas of sand dunes. So things that can manage to come up the coast from the Solway up by Turnberry and, and so on to, to the Ardeer area can't really get any further north. So that's part of the reason I suspect why um, that's, that's the limit. It might be a geographical one as well as a, a sort of biological one, if you like. It's also worth pointing out or admitting or whatever that uh, part of the reason for the being so many species recorded is that there's been a significant survey effort. Um, 
by a whole lot of people. Um, Jill Smart has done loads and loads on, on, on the plants. Um, Ian Hamlin, who's one of the heroes of the of, of this whole uh, business, has done loads and loads of work on birds and a whole range of invertebrates from uh, beetles to bees and wasps and, and flies and so on as well. So <clears throat> the more you look, the more you'll find. But I think in spite of that, our deer is still uh, fairly special. However, um, things are never ideal and there's a number of threats uh, which to some extent have always been there, some of them have always been there, <clears throat> but which have achieved a greater prominence uh, recently. I'm going to deal with these in order, <clears throat> starting off with the Special Development Order, SDO. This was uh, put in place by the UK government in 1953. And bizarrely, what it says in effect is that any new developments that are there don't require planning permission, uh, they can go ahead um, without planning permission and without the scrutiny that goes with the planning permission. The only exceptions were um, buildings over a certain height of high chimneys, but other than that, um, anything else can go ahead. Now that's fairly extraordinary, and perhaps even more extraordinary is that it's still valid. And we know it's been valid because there was a recent planning case where um, the owner of the site wanted to do something and essentially wrote to the council and said, I'm going to do it. Um, and I'm just letting you know. And whether the council wanted to approve it or not, um, they couldn't do anything about it. Uh, so that is a problem. Um, hopefully it's going to be revoked in the next year or so. Um, the revocation of it will come under the, the Scottish uh, planning bill that's going through the Scottish Parliament at the moment. Uh, but COVID has slowed everything down. So um, hopefully it'll be next year, but there's no guarantee. However, one other peculiarity of the SDO is that because it's there, SNH, now called Nature Scott, is barred from having any official input to the site. So if Nature Scott decide or thought that our deer might be of SSSI quality, we can't do anything about it. Um, they don't have the authority to go and survey it, and they certainly don't have the authority to designate it. So that, um, in effect, uh, means that um, the, the sort of highest level of protection that you can look for in, in national legislation is unavailable to the area. Uh, just as an example, um, there are several uh, sand extraction sites, sand quarries going on in Ardeer, mainly in, in, in uh, Garnet uh, West. Some at least of these don't have planning permission. So in terms of their mode of operation, in terms of rehabilitation, in terms of any sort of environmental impact assessment, none of that has, has gone ahead. So it's a fairly extraordinary situation. <clears throat> and the sand has been shifted out of these sites at a pretty high rate at the moment. Um, so that threat is, a, is a, 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 a real one and an ongoing one. The next one is the Ayrshire Growth Deal. Um, again, because uh, almost all of you are local, you will know that about the Ayrshire Growth Deal, the three councils have jointly received a very large amount of money from um, Scottish UK government and so on. <coughs> and one of North Ayrshire Council's priorities is the Irvine Harbour site area, what they've called the Great Harbour. And they want to develop this as a tourist hub 
um, mainly looking at the harbour side, uh, but also at, as I understand it, the beach park and so on as well. But <clears throat> although perhaps not in the initial first phase of this, they see Ardeer as being a later uh, development site. Um, an early vision that um, came out of this had almost the whole of um, Ardeer being developed for housing and tourism and so on. That particular vision seems to have disappeared. But more recently, North Ayrshire Council and NPL, who, who own most of the Ardeer site, have signed a memorandum of understanding relating to Ardeer um, with uh, development being um, implicit, at least, in it. But nowhere in the memorandum of understanding is there any mention of the wildlife and uh, it doesn't recognise the need for a strategic environmental assessment. Now, an SEA, um, maybe we're just mentioning briefly what an SEA is, as opposed to an environmental impact assessment. Um, the idea of an SEA is that that comes before you start looking at individual um, projects. So, as its name suggests, it's looking at a strategic overview and seeing the wider impact of development um, in general. Within that, if an SEA is, is um, favourable, then individual projects can go ahead and those individual projects may or may not require an environmental impact assessment. But the SEA would be the one where um, the, the full value uh, and importance of our dear um, would, be, would be obvious. Um, and if that was recognised, then um, any further developments would sit within that strategic framework rather than being individual assessments in their own right. This is a recent proposal by NPL. Um, the Scottish Government, uh, part of its planning uh, legislation, National Planning Forum, uh, sorry, National Planning Framework um, Programme, has asked for proposals. Uh, NPL have submitted this as a proposal. Um, they had previously said that they would consult with those of us who were concerned <clears throat> before they came up with anything, but that hasn't happened. So as you can see, um, the peninsula here has a bridge across. Um, it has um, leisure, residential, coastal amenity, whatever that means, presumably some sort of marina type situation here. Um, business and industry, residential, and so on. Effectively, developing the whole of the, the RDR site um, that I've been talking about um, and leaving precious little in the way of even, you know, one doesn't know what that is, but um, you can be fairly sure it's not going to be what's there just now. Um, there's a good bit of green wash if you look at it all. There's uh, green networks and energy centres and all the rest of it. But fundamentally, it's a development that would um, basically destroy the existing wildlife value of, of our deer. Now, <clears throat> I, personally, I rather doubt that that's going to happen, but that's not the point. The point is that um, there are plans afoot to develop the site in this way. And NPL have been making access increasingly difficult over the past year. They've put up lots of signs, um, some of which are illegal signs that they're making claims that aren't actually true. Um, 
when challenged, they're saying that um, the Scottish access legislation doesn't apply because of health and safety grounds, that there's barbed wire and trip hazards, um, which uh, are undoubtedly true, but um, I'm sure that most of us have been in lots of places where there's trip hazards. Um, in fact, if you go off the road or off the footpath, you're probably talking about trip hazards. So um, basically they're trying to, to limit access, partly for people like me, I suppose, but also for the people of Stevenson, which is up here. And the area is pretty well used. You rarely go there um, without bumping into somebody, not mass numbers, but uh, certainly other people. Now the third, I put it as a threat, um, local, local nature conservation sites. Um, you will be aware that all the Ayrshire councils have a list of local nature conservation sites, sites that don't qualify for one reason or another to be an SSSI, but are considered important in terms of um, the local, uh, local environment. Now in 2015, North Ayrshire Council uh, commissioned a review of the list of local nature conservation sites. And although our deer hadn't been in the previous list, it was included in the review. Perhaps not surprisingly, um, it came out um, by a, a mile as the best site in the council area. Invertebrates being particularly significant, but plants and birds as well. Now that review was submitted to the council in 2016, but it hasn't yet been accepted and adopted by the council. And the recent local development plan, which has a list of these sites in an appendix, uh, doesn't include our deer. Um, the upshot of that being that uh, both from a local point of view through the LNCS system and at a national level, through SSSI system, there is no official recognition of the value of our deer. And speaking personally, I think that that's a major problem, that uh, it doesn't say anywhere in official ease that our deer is important. And uh, I think that's something that um, is important that we need to change. So, with these threats in the offing, uh, an action group was set up uh, to raise the profile of the site, being led by SWT, but that's just for um, local reasons, I suspect, but it includes RSPB, RSPB Bug Life, Butterfly Conservation, um, I suppose Plant Life and so on as well, various other organisations and local naturalists. And the action group um, was instrumental in, in setting up more organised survey work, uh, particularly in 2018-2019, focusing on the invertebrates, which is where I got involved. I got involved in it from 2017, but mainly in 2018 and 2019. And as action groups do, we've been trying to hassle local and national politicians uh, about the site um, with varying degrees of success. Um, it's actually remarkably difficult um, because I uh, stay in um, East Ayrshire. Um, it's difficult to lobby local politicians um, when you're not from the local area and uh, MSPs can only deal with things which come from their constituencies. So it, it's actually remarkably difficult. You can send them loads of letters and um, it does have an effect, but it's, it's more difficult than it ideally would be. And the action group sees the STO revocation as being a major priority, uh, but also um, getting official recognition of the site's interests. 
so that when things are being discussed, the, the wildlife is, is on the table, if you like. Um, we've also uh, been getting some broader publicity. Um, we've had a session on reporting Scotland, uh, which went quite well, and on Landward, which went very well. And we've had articles in a variety of newspapers. Um, we've had uh, a splendid article in the Scottish Field with Roger Hissett and Ian Hamlin looking very resolute, um, ready to defend uh, the interests of the site with their lives by the look of them, very determined. And an article also in, in British Wildlife uh, earlier on this year. Um, the Action Group have tried very actively to engage with NPL and with North Ayrshire Council um, with varying degrees of success. And we have produced a very outline and draft alternative vision for the area. Uh, of necessity, it's fairly sketchy, I suppose. But in essence, what I think it does is to accept that um, the harbour site is going to be developed and, and the, the Great Harbour area is going to be developed for tourism. And that would be, um, I think, from what we've seen to be, if you like, facility-based tourism. I'm not going to use a phrase like Blackpool of the North, but it, I'm not I'm not saying it's going to be like that, but it would be facility based. It wouldn't be um, a walking, cycling sort of place. It would be a, a more mass tourism place. So to some extent, we would see our deer as being, uh, was the yin to the Great Harbour side, yang, if you like, uh, the other side of the coin, but as well as the, the mass tourism on the, on the, the south side, on the north side, it would be an area largely devoted to um, informal recreation, uh, possibly with some sort of um, marine sports or uh, forest related activities or whatever, um, but with still this core area, which I excluded right at the beginning, which is currently um, which has currently got industrial activity going on it, on in it, and the industrial site up here, those would continue to to be um, developed as as industrial sites, providing employment for local people. Um, the Garnock East is of sufficient importance in its own right to be uh, a nature reserve. And the dotted line here. Um, I don't know why it's going off there, but never mind, <clears throat> would be a rerouted Ayrshire coastal path, which as you'll know at the moment goes off in the wide blue yonder um, before getting back to the coast. And this would get it through um, countryside, if you like, and back onto the coast. And I know that the, the coastal path are keen to, to see that as a, as a, a new route for it. So there's not much detail there, um, and I don't think uh, there needs to be. We don't have the facilities and resources to uh, come up with a detailed plan, but it's an alternative vision, if you like, that we're, we're putting forward. We have met with uh, North Ayrshire Council. Um, many of the councillors uh, appear to be sympathetic, we, we responded positively to, to uh, letters that have been sent out. But nonetheless, the Council does seem reluctant to officially recognise uh, the importance of the site. But they do, the Council do also want to see the SDO got rid of. Um, but there's still this, um, still this wish to have some sort of development on the south end of the peninsula. And uh, at the moment, as far as we can make out, there are no plans to carry out 
um, a strategic environmental assessment. So um, that's kind of where we are just now. COVID has caused loads of problems, obviously for everybody, uh, but it also makes it quite difficult to gain the full attention of whether it's local or national government, um, or even uh, local people to some extent. Everybody has uh, other things on their mind and, and other priorities at the moment. But the concern is that in this, let's say it's a vacuum, but in this slight vacuum, that um, something might happen and slip through uh, under the net. So uh, I'm going to finish up with three, um, three slides. Um, reasons to protect our beer. Why should it be protected? One, it's very big. Um, and as we all know, the bigger a size, the bigger a, a, a site is, the better it is. By dint of having more space, more area, um, populations are, of anything is going to be relatively larger, um, less reason or less risk of them being becoming extinct, um, and greater range of habitats. It's relatively undisturbed, the dunes, for example. There are no golf courses and there's no urban development. And if you think of all the sand dune areas, in Ayrshire, start off at Turnberry, um, we've got a golf course. Uh, if you come up to Ayr, Prestwick, you've got um, urban and golf course developments, same at Shroon, Barassi and so on. All of these have got developments. The dunes are restricted uh, and not very big. So our deer is the largest area, particularly if you add on Stevenson Beach, uh, just to the north, which is more or less linked to it, um, then this is far and away the largest undisturbed dune system, albeit that it's been modified um, in Ayrshire. The estuaries and SSSI, as we've said, <coughs> is good for birds. Um, any sort of development that envisages a marina um, would impinge on that and run up against um, nature scott, who one hopes would vigorously resist it. It's certainly the best wildlife site in North Ayrshire, arguably in all Ayrshire, um, and it's the best site for bees and wasps in Scotland, apparently. Stephen Falk, who's the, um, the bee and wasp person in Britain and has recently produced the latest uh, identification guide to bees and wasps, <coughs> uh, reckons it's the best bee and wasp site in Scotland. Um, so I'm prepared to, to take his word for it. It's obviously a prime uh, birding site and it's also, as we've seen albeit very rapidly tonight, home to lots of rare and scarce invertebrates and um, invertebrates don't usually get much of a much of a press, but I think uh, it's worth uh, it's worth raising the profile of them here. <clears throat> it's also worth looking at potential reasons why people shouldn't develop our deer, leaving aside the wildlife. First of all, you've got the sea wall, which you saw the picture of. <clears throat> Down the south end here is starting to crumble. Um, one can imagine that that crumbling will continue as you go further up. I would have thought that, to put it bluntly, there isn't a cat in hell's chance of anybody actually rebuilding or maintaining the seawall. And if you look at the SEPA um, coastal erosion map, it has this area here marked in as um, I'm not sure if it terms it high risk, but it puts it at the top, the top of its um, coastal erosion categories. So whatever happens on here has to take account of the potential crumbling, or partial crumbling at least, 
of that wall. Sea level rise is another issue. And again, looking at the SEPA map for um, sea level rise and flooding, Garnock East is um, highlighted as being an area um, at high risk, as are various parts of, of here. And in fact, uh, this little bit in here is already um, semi-salt marsh. I think it's only flooded at very, very high tides, um, but it doesn't take much of an increase in, in, in sea level to, or, or flooding to, um, to flood that. It's also worth bearing in mind <coughs> what went on here for a hundred years and more. Um, it was used as, amongst other things, an explosives factory. Uh, and there certainly has been all sorts of fairly hideous chemicals involved in the process. There has been some, some decontamination, but I'm not, not convinced, I don't think anybody's convinced that the decontamination has been done completely. So there's still a risk from, <coughs> from that. And finally, access to the site is quite difficult. Um, I've mentioned the railway line up at the top here. To get into Garnock East means going through a tunnel under the railway um, to get other access up there would mean driving in a road or building a new bridge across from Garnock West. To get onto the southern end of the peninsula, there's a pedestrian bridge to the big idea, but any, for any sort of serious development, you would need to build a road bridge. I'm reliably informed that that would cost the best part of 20 million pounds. So that seems a bit of a non-starter. And I think one of the problems, one of the big problems is actually this, which is the big idea. Because the big idea is there, I'm sure it's felt that it's a facility that needs to be used. Um, and that personal view, I think, is one of the reasons why um, North Ayrshire Council are keen to do something on the peninsula, even if perhaps it was only um, reinvigorating, reinvigorating the big idea for some purpose or another. We talk of it as a, a venue for arts and music and whatever, I don't know. Um, that's all a possibility. Obviously, that would need the rebuilding of the, the pedestrian access at the very least. So the future, well, recognition in some form or another. Um, in that sense, that perhaps is the easy bit. You can make it a local nature conservation site and that doesn't change the situation very much. But what happens in terms of ownership? If we assume that it is going to be protected, um, because we're optimistic and we have to make that assumption, who would take on all part of that a site of, a, of that size? Um, would it be any uh, North Ayrshire Council? Would it be an NGO or Nature Scott or some sort of Friends of, of our dear uh, type setup or some sort of combination of, of all of it? Um, would different parts be taken on by different groups? Who knows? Um, that's something that would need to be sorted. But if we as um, an action group are trying to protect the site, then we have to at least think of what would happen and how it would be managed in the future. It would need some sort of management plan with agreed objectives. <clears throat> Those would clearly involve conservation and infor informal recreation in some form or another, whether that be cycling or walking or whatever, but may well be other uh, recreational activities. Um, that were relatively low key and, and, and low impact at least. Never mind ownership, who would actually implement it? This is not a good time to be looking for anything that's going to involve money. Um, so uh, what sort of management plan could you have that was as light touch as possible? Um, how much of that could be done by volunteers? Could it be done by uh, North Ayrshire Council through um, it's Leisure Trust, 
um, overseeing volunteers. I don't know. These are all just possibilities. And the same applies to funding. These are the obvious places to think of. Um, but uh, that's further down the line. I'm really putting it in there because there's no point in saying we're going to do something about RD and protect it if you don't recognise the fact that um, protecting it does require uh, ongoing management and that ongoing management requires some sort of investment. So that is um, our dear. Some pictures of other invertebrates of all sorts of kinds. I've tried to be even-handed. It's not all just beetles. I've got a bug and damselfly and a grasshopper and so on. So there's all sorts of things that are there. Um, one of the problems perhaps is that they're not always easy to see. It doesn't mean they're not important. So thank you for watching and I hope that uh, you find it uh, you find it interesting and useful. Over to you, Robbie. Thank you. <laughs> you stopped sharing your screen now. Well, have I? Sorry about that. Well, it doesn't matter if you do that. Um, thank you very much, Bruce. I know some people have been posting things up onto a, on the chat, asking questions. I don't know if Bruce saw them or not, but I think pretty much everything that was put on the chat I think was covered. Um, yeah, comment from B. Really informative to talk. Thank you. We else the new to area. This was very. Oop. You can see the rest of it, but the chat comments are there um, for people to see if they wish to look at them. Uh, I don't know if you want to take any questions via the chat, Bruce, or do you want to just leave it to that? Um, um, well, the, the... I don't really like. There's lots of questions, and clearly. Um, <laughs> we can't go through them all. Um, if, if, if people want to ask some questions, and I'll do a few just now, but I can, um, if the details are there, I can get back to them later on with, with answers. Um, but I'm happy to take any questions just now if, uh, if people want to ask them. When Wendy Spencer's put a question up as opposed to just praising you. Um, are there any snakes on our deer that you've seen? Not that I know of. Um, there are lizards, but I don't know um, if there are. I haven't, there haven't been any records of snakes. Right. There you go. Anyway, any other questions you want to put them up in chat? Because it's easier, I think, rather than letting loose, with, as I say, with microphones, because uh, if I open it up and everybody starts talking, we'll not hear any questions. Um, if anybody's got any more, just if you know how to, just click on the chat button at the bottom of the screen and type it in. I think this is, uh, oh, who, who coordinates the action group? Oh. Who does? Um, Roger, Roger Hissett is the, uh, is El Supremo, the long-suffering and incredibly patient man who has resisted the temptation to throw things at the wall, or at least in meetings he hasn't. So Roger is the is, the, is the, the chair of the, the action group. If, um, if anybody wants to get in touch with Richard, what you could do is, is if you contact the SWT, um, the local SWT group under SWT Ayrshire dot, I've forgotten the website, I've forgotten the email now, um, at Gmail, that's what it is, SWT Ayrshire at Gmail dot com. Um, then uh, the secretary can put you in touch with uh, Roger, and you can, if anybody wants to get involved with the with the uh, action group, I'm sure Roger will be delighted. Um, and somebody's uh, I did record start the recording for this, and and, and unfortunately I, I missed the first few minutes, which was the slides about Nobel and stuff, which is um, unfortunate. But the rest of it's there. I'm not 100% sure what we're going to do with that how we're going to make it available. Um, what I have got is everybody's email via the ticketing system. So what I can do is once I've found out how we can make it available, whether it's through YouTube, 
Facebook or a the mail. Um, I shall uh, I shall fire an email out to everyone, and it can obviously be circulated around that. And I'll make sure it gets on the SWT um, Ayrshire Facebook page as well, which is a good place to go to get information. It also tells you what else uh, Harry and, and Jill and the team are up to on the other reserves. Um, I'm sure most people know that the that, that SWT have got many, many reserves in Ayrshire, coming all the way from, from Irvine, all the way down to, to South Ayrshire, East Ayrshire, um, New Cumberland Way, there's, there's loads of them. So if you go on the web, SWT website, you can see that we've got lots and lots of reserves around Ayrshire. So Brian's asking if there's any detonators been found in the area that would be dangerous for strolling around. Um, not that I'm aware of. Uh, <laughs> uh, no, I, I think anything on the surface has probably been, been cleared away. Um, the trouble is, in the past, it tends to be all anecdotes. It's difficult to, to, to say anything that's desperately definitive. But um, there's certainly anecdotally been stuff that's been buried. Um, and there's also mentioned that the Luftwaffe had taken pictures of our deer. And um, there were, I think, a couple of, of raids um, that it was bombed. And somebody claims that because there was a stick of bombs that came down, one of them didn't go off and it's still there somewhere. <laughs> but I don't know whether that's true or not. Almost certainly not. <laughs> so it, it's difficult to say. I think um, what, one thing which is maybe indicative of the fact that, that it's, it's maybe not um, anything that obvious on the surface. In the wet areas, there's no obvious sign of nasty pollution. The, the water is a bit silty, um, so it's not sort of clean, clear water, but it's not, uh, doesn't show signs of, of being chemically, um, uh, chemically tainted, if you like. Yeah. There's a few folk asking how you actually can go onto the peninsula, Bruce. What's the easiest way to go on? I know, I know MPL are making it as difficult as possible, but is there an easy, yeah. easy um, way to go on? I don't say easy way. The, right. Well, the, the Garnet West is a bit more difficult because MPL have been, or sorry, new sand quarrying has made it more difficult to get in. So if Let's just limit it to Garnock East and to the peninsula. The peninsula <clears throat> is relatively easy. If you go to Stevenson Point and walk down the coast, mm. if you walk all the way down the coast um, to the bottom, um, the seawall, the crumbling seawall stops just before the end. You can walk all the way down and up onto the, up the dunes that are at the south end and in that way. If you don't want to walk all the way down, you can walk part of the way down and um, you can get up over the seawall. Um, it's reluctant to say it's, it's easy to get into because it's not desperately easy unless you're reasonably spry. Um, so um, that, that would be how to get onto the peninsula. To get to Garnock East, if you go to the... If, uh, imagine you were going to the Garnock Floods SWT Reserve and carry on down that road, down from the A whatever it is, 84, 94, I can remember what the name of the, the, the road up to Ardrossan is. Anyway, turning down to the Garnock Floods uh, and parking in the lay-by at the, um, the Cope at the waste disposal site there and then walking just past the entrance into the, into the cope, there's a path to your right. That path will take you under the railway, and if you follow that round, that gets you into Garnock East. Alternatively, you can walk from the golf course um, at uh, the old Bogside Racecourse and walk up from there. And those would be the best ways in. 
Somebody's asking if there's any plans for an education programme to, to get people interested, um, local schools. Uh, yes. We, the Action Group has considered a, a whole variety of things. Um, obviously, um, the television things, um, newspaper articles and so on are geared to raising awareness. Um, and obviously something like tonight is as well. <coughs> uh, we know that, or we're led to believe that, um, community groups in Stevenson are against development and are sympathetic to our ideas. And obviously there's lots of people who either have connections with or an interest in um, Nobel and the whole industrial heritage of the site. I mean, there's another one or two, at least, talks about the industrial heritage of our dear, never mind the, the wildlife of it. Um, so uh, there's, there's some reasonable awareness. I think one of our problems, and it might be a, a daft thing to say, is that at the moment we don't have anything to object to. We have problems, um, as I've said, with the special development order, with the, the theatre growth deal. Um, none of these actually have anything as a definite plan on paper. Um, and therefore, we don't have something that we can say, look, this is uh, what's being proposed. This is why it's a bad thing. This is what we suggest as an alternative or, or whatever. And we don't have that. Um, we don't have that yardstick to, or that target, if you like, to aim at. Um, so uh, we're saying, if you like, um, there are threats to the site, and there are likely to be developments, but we don't have the developments there as yet. Perhaps you know, uh, one obvious risk is if somebody came along to NPL tomorrow and said, um, "Here's uh, however many million pounds." Uh, we want to do X, Y, and Z on the peninsula, it might actually be very difficult for us to stop it just now um, because of the SDO. We don't need the planning permission. I think that's unlikely. NPL have owned the site for over 20 years, as I understand it, and there haven't been any developments in that time. So um, that also suggests to me that it's not an easy site to develop. So in that sense, the threats might be less than we fear, but um, I don't want to take that chance. And I want, as an absolute starter, if you like, the recognition of the site as being important so that anything that happens subsequent to that takes that into account. Yeah. Some, somebody's mentioned they would best not mention it to Trump. <laughs> well, there might be hidden explosives. I don't know. <laughs> uh, I do know with my, my I had, uh, people who worked within the big idea that there was some concern when the big idea was getting built about explosives and things, but I don't think they ever, ever came across anything. Um, there was a, a, an apophical story of a digger that's that uh, the guy turned up one day to dig a hole, put his shovel in the ground and there was loud banging involved. Uh, he jumped off the digger and the digger was still there so many years later. Whether that's true or not, I don't know. But uh, I do know people who work for ICI creating explosives. In fact, one of them's on the talk tonight, listening to the talk tonight. And, and certainly they used to go out and, and set things off. But the bottom line is if you've got unused explosives, then it's failed. So it probably still won't go off. If it didn't go off the first time, then <laughs> what's it going to do now? Uh, yeah, well, and it's, it's also worth bearing in mind that there is still an explosives factory there. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, Kemmering is a, obviously a different order of magnitude to what happened before, um, but there's still, you know, a, a safety zone around uh, the factory. Um, so, uh, that's 
another consideration that, that uh, I'm sure any developer would take account of. But yeah, I mean, you're, you're talking about building houses next to an explosive factory. It's not exactly, uh, it's not exactly a selling feature, is it? And, and given the also the, uh, the Guy Fox would be good though. Hmm. Well, Guy Fox. <laughs> but yeah, the um, and and the overall antipathy towards building houses on floodplains in these places, which easily flood due to, the, as you said, the, the climate change and what have you. I mean, that whole area basically is, is just begging to be flooded out very, very quickly and, and without much great rise in sea level, I would have thought. It's all a bit strange. Somebody was asking, who's the boss of NPL? Do we have anyone who knows him? Um, no, it's a, it's a big company. It's not it's not a company that's based in, in Stevenson or Irvine. No, it's, it's, uh, I think it's possibly an international company. It's certainly a big company. And they have very, very big assets. And they are big into developing ex industrial sites, big industrial sites. Yeah. So this is just one of their portfolio. Yeah, the, 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 the brown sites, redeveloping brown sites is their thing. And yeah. big, one of the biggest brownfield redevelopment companies in the world. Somebody's just commented yeah. on here that as far as I can tell, NPL Scotland Limited changed their name to Ardeer Regeneration Limited as of the 2nd of April 2020. Thank you, Gary. That's interesting. Well, that goes, that goes a lot, so about the same time as that plan that I showed you. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think one other thing which I haven't mentioned, which is probably, possibly worth mentioning, is the position of Nature Scott, SNH, as was. Um, Stupid name. <laughs> Whatever you think of the name. Um, obviously, they, they, they can't get directly involved in, in designating it and so on. They, ex they accept that that's, that's the case, that's legally the case. But um, I'm just disappointed that they haven't, to our knowledge at least, made their feelings known about the site to um, the council, and also that they can't see that here is perhaps an opportunity. We're looking at regeneration of ex-industrial land. You know, regeneration doesn't have to involve putting buildings on it. There's lots of examples from down south in particular, where whether it be gravel pits or whether it be, um, you know, the, the various brownfield sites round about London, uh, which are fantastic for um, invertebrates, um, you know, and these are recognised and people campaign to protect them. Um, so Ardeer is a another similar site, you know, Ardeer could be Scotland's equivalent to rain and marshes or whatever it is, if you like. Um, and in, in some ways it's, it's quite similar to Cool Links, you know, it could be Ayrshire's Cool Links equivalent. It doesn't have the designations, but it does have the beasts, and it has a hell of a lot more habitats. Um, it just doesn't have the, you know, the the, the oomph behind it, and, and Nature Scott don't seem to be in a mood to um, get involved particularly. They might well get involved once a development is proposed, but what we want to try and do is to head off objecting to a development we want it to be, yeah. to be done strategically. Rear, rear guard action that, isn't it? Try to ward it off the right. as opposed to get something else in place first. Get your retirement. To be proactive. As they say. Uh, somebody's commenting on the fact that, it, uh, that you, surely you mean rewilding rather than re regeneration. I don't think so. It is regeneration. No, I don't think so either. No, I, I, I deliberately use the word regeneration yeah. because I think we're not, we're not, we can't be talking about making all of this into a nature reserve, full stop. I think, you know, we've got to consider at the very least recreation, informal recreation. We're not looking to have, you know, um, up Alton Towers type rides on it or anything like that. But, uh, you know, there's treetop trails, there's, there's a whole variety of things. And bear in mind, that um, lots of these things, if, if, if our suggestion came anywhere near to fruition, access 
to the site would be from the Stevenson end and uh, could well bring people to Stevenson, could bring some money into Stevenson, you know, um, whether it be through cafes and catering or, or whatever. Um, it, it requires somebody with more imagination than me to come up with the bright ideas. I'm not a bright ideas man. I'm happy to look down a microscope at Beatles, but um, you know, there are opportunities here and, and it's trying to get people to uh, raise their eyes a bit um, beyond the obvious and, and, and have a think about it. Yeah, I think I think it's anything that's going to be successful here's got to be a mixture of both just to, to get to get money into it as well as getting the people into it. So it's it's, it's got to be a mixture of both. Right. I think let everyone, we'll try and let everyone go. I'm going to try and unmute people just simply on the basis, and I don't know if this works because I've tried it before and it's all gone, gone a bit strange on me. Uh, and it's now tell, telling me it doesn't want it. Oh, I, nobody. Oh, well, there we go. Um, what I was trying to do was unmute everyone and allow them to uh, give you a round of applause. Everybody re unmutes themselves, really, Robbie. Sorry, Brian? I think if everybody unmutes themselves. Yes, I need to yeah. call it now. It, 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 if everybody would like to unmute themselves, and, and it's relatively easy to do, um, I would like to actually just let everybody uh, give, give the appreciation that Bruce deserves, I think, for an excellent talk. Uh, you can't do a round of applause on this. It's all right. Sure. We can see what happens. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Excellent, excellent. Thank you very much, Bruce. Uh, Thank you. The talk is in a month's time, and I have now, it's now just shot straight out the side of my head. I didn't write it down before I started. Um, but it's a, the, my recollection is that it is a lady, and I can't remember her name, that's terrible, who is a mammals expert and from the Falls of Clyde. And she's going to tell us all about how to spot mammals in the wild, in the garden, and all that good stuff. So hopefully we'll get we'll email from Harry at the SWT. Like say, uh, is, is thank you very much to SOC who lent us their uh, Zoom license to have this talk tonight. Um, hopefully we can get something sorted out and get it get ourselves licensed up. I'm having chats with the SWT about that at the moment. Um, so, but thank you very much, Brian and the SOC for lending us their license. Excellent. Thank you all very much. And uh, I think we'll call it a night at that. Yeah, okay. thanks very much. Thank you, Robbie. It's been really thank interesting. You. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good night and thank you. Brian, can you I'll switch the recording off?